Um, hey guys, um, my name is Megan Whitaker. I um, have a, a blog and a company called Going Crunchy Not Crazy. I was a registered nurse for several years. I was diagnosed with an autoimmune disease about uh, 10 years ago and I had trouble getting it treated traditionally and ended up using um, holistic um, alternative medicine and then kind of detoxed my whole life and that healed my, all my symptoms went away and I have been completely medication free for about seven years now. Um, so when my older daughter was born, I decided to uh, leave traditional nursing and now I help families uh, to remove the environmental and like physical toxins and chemicals in their homes and um, get them on a clean diet. So um, I also just, I launched a podcast, um, same name, Going Crunchy Not Crazy, um, where I talk about this kind of stuff as well. But I love talking about the gut and the microbiome. It is sort of like the perfect mix for me of um, alternative health and science. There have been a lot of things coming out recently. Um, you may have seen in the news things about probiotics, things about the microbiome and gut health. And that is because right now, we have got a lot of research that has been um, that has been released recently to show the importance of the gut. About 10 to 15 years ago, scientists pretty much thought that the gut did one thing, it digested your food. But we now know that that is not true. There is a doctor who worked at Vanderbilt University, which is where um, I am from, I'm from Nashville, so he's right down the street. And uh, he was doing some of this early research about 10 years ago, and he has what he calls the modern plagues of childhood. And that's things like obesity, asthma, um, seasonal allergies, reflux, eczema, uh, early onset diabetes, and uh, behavioral disorders like the operation, oppositional defiance disorder, autism, and things of, of that spectrum. And those diseases pretty much unheard of over 100 years ago. They have gone up astronomically in the last 30 to 40 years, and his research has linked every one of those things with the gut bacteria. So um, basically, if you don't know what the microbiome is, that is all of the microbes that live, live on your body. Right now, as you sit here as an adult, you have between two and six pounds of bacteria on you. You have about a hundred trillion bacteria cells in your body. You actually have nine times more bacteria than you do human cells. You are more bacteria than you are human. Your gut has about 39 trillion bacteria in it. And most of the ba those bacteria are good guys. When we first discovered bacteria, scientists all thought bacteria make you sick and we need to kill them all. And we have then created what we now call the hygiene hypothesis. And the hygiene hypothesis basically says that we have cleaned ourselves sick. Now we have, we have Clorox bleach, we have chlorine in our water, we have antibiotics and everything from pills to paint to put on your walls. And all of those impact all of the bacteria that are living on you that are helping you. Your gut bacteria do really important things for you. They do things for you like they make vitamin K2. Um, for all of you women who have had babies, you may know vitamin K2 is very important in clotting. Your body cannot make it. You can't make it. Most foods actually don't have it. There's only a few foods that have it. But your gut bacteria actually produce it in their waste for you. They also um, make several different kinds of B vitamins. Your body can't make those, but your gut bacteria can. And so, about if you're if you're not sure what, you know, 39 trillion bacteria. It's not it's, it's a lot. Um, if you have take one millimeter, about that big. There's about a billion bacteria in that much of your gut. You have a couple feet of that, just, just to give you a, a little heads up. So I um, have, have been a crunchy mom since I, the day that I got pregnant, and I have, I have two little girls, and my two births were, were similar in some ways, but different in others. Um, my first birth, I was so ready for like my 38 hour like marathon natural labor, and I had her in less than six hours. I almost had her in a car, which is something that I do not recommend. Uh, she, I, I got to the birth center and I was there for seven minutes before she was born. So when baby number two came along, when I got pregnant, about five seconds after I found out I was pregnant, I 
my first thought was I do not want to be pushing in a car again. So I decided to stay home. And I had a home birth for number two. And that was a good choice because my labor was three hours long. Uh, I was only in active labor for two hours. My midwife barely made it. And my labor was so fast, my daughter was nearly born in the sac. My, um, the amniotic sac did not rupture until she was coming out. She was born so fast that um, when she came out and the water broke, we thought that she had gotten a little bit of water in her lungs. And so we ended up taking her to the hospital to get checked. She looked fine. She seemed fine. But, you know, being at home in that situation was scary. We got there and the hospital did not know what to do with us. Um, so they sent us to the NICU and we, they watched her for two days and they sent us home because she was good. What we didn't know at the time is she had picked up something in the NICU. A few days later, she spiked a very high fever. She got very sick, we got very scared, and I had to rush my newborn baby back to the emergency room where she got a spinal tap and multiple rounds of antibiotics at less than two weeks old. So while both of my girls um, had you know, totally crunchy, natural, zero drug labors, one had her microbiome intact. She was born vaginally. She was placed on my chest and bred, breastfed for over a year, and one of my daughters was barely born vaginally because she was born in the sac. She got antibiotics for three days at less than two weeks old. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important. So there are, what I like to think of as two guts. There's the gut that we would have had a thousand years ago, had you been born, and then there's the modern gut of today. So this is my helper. This is my, this is my daughter's baby. So we're gonna pretend that I am a mom a thousand years ago and I get pregnant and my body realizes that I am pregnant and almost immediately does a very cool thing. It increases the number of lactobacillus bacteria in the vagina. Now your, the vagina has about 300 different kinds of microbes. Most of them are lactobacillus. When you get pregnant, that number goes way up and that does a couple of very important things. Number one, it lowers the pH of the vagina so that bad bacteria cannot live in there. It makes your vagina acidic and ba bacteria can't go up and reach baby. Another cool thing is that when nine months later I go into labor, I have some contractions and my water breaks, water comes down through the vagina and how do you clean your floors? I mean, do you clean your floor with a dry mop or a wet mop? Clean it with a wet mop, why? Because it's gonna get all that dirt up. Same thing, water enters the vagina, sweeps all of the lactobacillus up and when baby, decides to come down, it smushes all of that lactobacillus that's in there up into baby. And some of you are probably like, ew, but it's not, it's not gross, this is magical, okay? It's magical. All of that bacteria is gonna get up into baby's nose, get into baby's ears, and get into baby's mouth, all over baby's hands. Baby comes down and who knows the perfect position for baby to be born in. Head down, face, back. What else is back there? nightmare in labor but something really cool happens baby gets born face down and they, they get a sample of mom's gut bacteria mom's gut bacteria is mostly a species that we call bifidobacterium there are thousands and thousands of different kinds of bacteria in the intestines most of them are different kind of bifidobacterium so you now have lactobacillus all over baby bifidobacteria all over baby's nose and mouth and then what do we do we pick baby up put baby on chest. Now we get a little bit of mom's skin bacteria, which is mostly in the staph family. And some of you are like, staph is bad. But remember, most bacteria are good. And most staph are okay. Most staph are fine. But staph is what like our skin. And so now baby's got staph on its skin. And then baby goes to breast and it nurses. So now baby isn't really getting milk in this moment, but it is swallowing. So now baby swallows lactobacillus bifidobacterium bacteria and just a tiny bit of staph. And baby doesn't have a mature tummy or mature intestines. And so it's got a clear shot all the way to the colon. There's nothing to kill these bacteria. And it's got a bunch of empty neighborhoods. So it gets to live wherever it wants to. And bifidobacteria and lactobacillus fill up the gut. And then mom's milk comes in. Milk is pretty much made of two things. It's made of lactose and it's made of oligosaccharides. Lactose sounds a lot like lactobacillus. It's lactobacillus' favorite food, so it feeds those. And then for about 50 years, scientists had absolutely no idea why oligosaccharides were in milk. Fun fact about breast milk, it is the least studied body fluid that you have. 
every other body fluid that exists, we know way more about it than we know about breast milk. But about a dozen years ago, scientists realized that oligosaccharides were only eaten by bifidobacteria. If you took a whole bunch of oligosaccharides, you couldn't do anything with it. It would pass right through you. You can't digest it. It's like this long in terms of, of, of a protein. It's a huge, complex starch that we can't break down. But bifidobacteria loves it. There's one species in particular that really like it called Bifidobacteria infantis. And recent studies are showing that while 100% of newborn babies used to have this about 100 years ago, only about 15% of newborns have it now at six months. Because we're not giving them these wonderful oligosaccharides. So that is the 10,000 year old gut. Now there's the modern gut. So now I get pregnant and I make lots of lactobacillus, but maybe I need to have an emergency C-section. Maybe I have MGBS positive and I have antibiotics in labor. Maybe you're like me and you have a baby that ends up sick and needs antibiotics later, or you can't breastfeed, or baby is adopted. And we have all of these things that limit the number of bacteria. If you have a C-section, you're not getting mom's lactobacillus or bifidobacteria. If you um, start antibiotics in labor, which 40% of moms now get antibiotics in the 48 hours around labor, you have those bacteria, but you've drastically reduced the number that you that baby is getting. Maybe if you can't breastfeed, you aren't getting that oligosaccharides. You're still getting lactose. So the lactobacillus is happy, but those poor bifidobacteria, they die. So what do we do? So um, this is the one I tell you not to panic, because I panicked, guys. I was like, I'm gonna have my, my home birth, and my baby's gonna be skin to skin forever, and I'm gonna breastfeed till she's seven, and it was gonna be great, and that's just not the modern gut. And even if that was something that had happened, we've got chlorine in our water, which is there for the express purpose of killing bacteria, and which I want, because I don't want to be drinking water out of my faucet that is full of bad bacteria, but it does impact the gut. So there's lots of things that we can do um, to help make sure that our modern gut looks a little bit more like our thousand year old gut. There's a very cool study that is not finished yet. It's still in the process in New York. Um, it's a doctor named Dr. Um, Domingos Bello who is doing a research study where she's taking um, folded gauze and actually inserting it into the vagina before a c-section and then they are wiping down the baby and, that, and again some of you are going ew gross but it's not gross it's magical because we are seeing that the early results of this study show that babies who are born via c-section who get wiped down with mom's bacteria look significantly more like babies who are born vaginally Babies who are born via C-section, typically their first major dose of bacteria is the arms of the nurse or dad or the chest of mom, and so then they are staph dominant. So that's skin bacteria. So they're skipping the other bacteria, and that's gonna create what we call dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is what is linked to those things like obesity, asthma, behavioral disorders, eczema, all of that stuff. When we give antibiotics, antibiotics are amazing. Like I said, my baby was sick at four in the morning, less than two weeks after she was born. No baby should have a fever like that. And I was very grateful for those antibiotics. My sister had to have an emergency C-section. A hundred years ago, she may not have survived. I'm very grateful for those antibiotics. But there's some interesting things about antibiotics. Does anybody know when antibiotics were discovered? 1928, so we have had antibiotics for less than 100 years. They started being used in mass in the 30s and 40s, and farmers started to use them for their farm animals um, that were milking. Cows get um, mastitis too, so all you moms that breastfeed, poor cows, they get mastitis too, and they had to be given antibiotics. And something crazy happened. They found that the cows that they gave antibiotics to got fatter. But they got 15% fatter, and they also grew taller. 
and the farmers were like, this is great because bigger cows mean more meat, which means more money, and they started trying it with more animals, but then it was expensive, so then they tried it with less antibiotics, and they found a really interesting thing, that it does not matter what kind of antibiotic you give, and you can even give it at such a low dose that it wouldn't actually cure anything, the cows still gained weight. Now, about 60 years on, we don't actually know why that works. There's a couple of theories. One of the theories is that by giving an antibiotic, you are telling your gut bacteria that something is wrong and they don't know what's wrong, and so it tells your body to intake more calories. It actually allows more calories to the gut. That's one theory. Another theory is that there is a type of bacteria in there that is helping to regulate metabolism and calorie uptake, and we don't know which one it is yet, but there may be one that we are hurting with these antibiotics. So you can give a sub-therapeutic dose, a dose that wouldn't cure anything, and you're gonna gain 15% of weight. We also know that it takes between two years and 10 years for your gut to go back to normal after a round of antibiotics. So in the perfect world, we wouldn't need those, but in the perfect world, also nobody would get sick. Um, there's a couple of things that we can do for babies who do need antibiotics or who have to be born via C-section that can't be wiped down, and that is to give bifidobacterium. Infantis is, is one way. Any kind of probiotic is going to be good for baby because again, baby doesn't have a mature tummy, doesn't have mature stomach acid, doesn't have the enzymes that's gonna kill any of these bacteria, and there's lots and lots of open space in there. As an adult, you can take lots and lots and lots of probiotic. You can take billions and billions of probiotic, and it, it might land in your gut, but it might not, because all of your real estate is taken. Your real estate is full. Unless you have a significant medical condition, most of the research is saying that taking a probiotic as an adult doesn't do a whole lot, unfortunately, because uh, that'd be great. There are other things that can be helpful, but, but as an adult, if you are relatively healthy, your gut is set. Your gut is set by about three, but we have a window in here until you're about three years old that we can do a lot to improve that gut. So a good, um, a good probiotic that has multiple strains, we want lots of strains, of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium is the first step. Bifidobacteria infantis is the second, because that is the bacteria that we are seeing that is extremely dominant in most infants that is now almost gone. And the research shows that it's actually significantly changing the acidity of baby poop. They were, they were finding that baby poop was becoming more acidic and they did not know why, and it took several years of cross-referencing lots of studies to realize that it was actually this one strain, and that's rare, because like I said, there are thousands and thousands of strains that we don't usually know a whole lot about the specific little bacteria, guys, but this one we do. So there's a couple of companies that make it. The biggest problem with that is that Bifidobacteria infantis really only likes to eat one food. That's oligosaccharides. So this is when something like a milk donor can come in really candy for moms who maybe can't breastfeed. And that may not sound like the greatest thing for some, some people don't like the idea of, of milk donation, but in this instance it can be extremely helpful because you can't give bifidobacteria infantis without a little bit of breast milk. The other thing, if, if this lovely baby had been born a thousand years ago, when, um, when I got tired of holding it, I'd put it down, and I would have probably put it down in dirt. Now we, night, we live in nice houses, in, in little boxes, and we have wood floors or carpet floors, and baby crawls around on that nice and safe, but a thousand years ago that wouldn't have been the case, and they would have been put down in dirt. And babies like to do one thing, they like to put every single thing in their mouth. I run around after my daughter all day long pulling leaves out of her mouth, whether we are inside or outside, I don't know where she finds them, but she finds them. Um, and a thousand years ago, I probably would have still been running around trying to make her not swallow or choke on leaves, but I wouldn't have been able to stop her from getting dirt in her mouth. And dirt has lots of bacteria in it. It also has iron in it. And if you are a breastfeeding mom or have ever been a breastfeeding mom or helped a breastfeeding mom, you may know that a lot of infants are low in iron. And there are a lot of research um, scientists that believe that we are low in iron for two reasons. First reason, is that a lot of bad bacteria eat iron. So if you are low in iron as an infant, when your gut bacteria can't do a lot of 
can't do a lot for you, that may actually be protective to a certain point. And then when you are to the point where you're six, seven, eight months old, when you are at the lowest level that you'll ever be in your life of iron naturally, if you're a breastfed baby, that's, the, that's your lowest level. That's when you go to the doctor and you get a, a, a heel stick and they panic and they tell you to start fortifying with iron. You would have fortified with iron by putting your baby on the ground and letting them crawl around and getting iron in their mouth from dirt. So that goes back to that hygiene hypothesis that we might be cleaning ourselves sick. Now, I, I know this, and, and I, I have it deeply ingrained in me, but it is still really hard for me when my daughter is in the backyard and her hands are dirty, and I'm like, I don't know if I should do this or not. It's a, it's a struggle, but, but that has been how we have survived for millennia. There's a couple of other things that we can do, especially for formula-fed babies. If you are formula-feeding at all, or then when we start early foods at you know six, seven, eight months old, we're cooking with water, we're putting water in bottles. What did I say that that water had in it? Chlorine. So even a basic tabletop um, charcoal filter will get rid of a lot of chlorine. But that's an important step for a baby. We do not want to chlorinate their gut if possible. So, you know, a Brita filter can go a long way. Chlorine is actually a gas. It is a... Um, and it's mixed in with several other chemicals to solidify it before it's put into water. But it is a gas. And if you um, let water stand, like sit out on the counter, it will naturally evaporate after a while as well. Um, so it's, it's really, really easy to get the chlorine out of your water, but it is important to do. Bath water is the same water that comes out of your tap. So bath water is chlorinated as well. So um, we have a filter on our shower that takes out the chlorine, and I fill up my bath that way pretty easy. I mean, you can also let your bath water sit there, but then your bath water is going to get cold. So I wouldn't suggest that one. For parents, for a lot of pregnant moms, you know, your baby is only going to be able to get the bacteria that you have. That's just, that's a fact. You're going to, their baby's going to get the 300 or so species in the vagina and the thousand or so species that you have in your own gut. So if there is dysbiosis in mom, if they have really high level of candida and yeast, which is absolutely rampant in American Western culture, they're gonna get candida and yeast and then they're gonna get thrush because it's been pushed up into baby's nose and baby's mouth and maybe, you know, seven, eight days, nine, nine, seven, eight, nine days into life, they get yeast in their mouth and they go and they get nice statin, but you can also keep that from happening by checking out to see if mom has candida or yeast in the vagina and in the intestinal tract before labor, and then baby won't get seated with those guys. There's a couple ways to do that. Um, a very nice company um, named Verisana, um, they do complete stool analysis. They sent me one to do. I actually did, I did a couple of stool analyses. I've been working on a couple of podcasts for the my microbiome, and I did a few gut health tests, and some of them are not so great. Um, some of them will give you really cool long lists of every single bacteria species you have in your gut, but unless you know what to do with that. It's not very helpful. Um, the Verisana test can tell you if there's candida, can tell you your pH, if there's inflammation, it's all sorts of cool stuff. I have a coupon if you guys are interested in that kind of thing, but it's not for me, it's just for you. I don't get anything from that. Um, but it's so important to know mom's status if you have a good, healthy biome. Now, if you don't, if your microbiome is off, if you have a crazy high level of E. coli, if you have crazy inflammation, if you have things like Crohn's, diarrhea, chronic constipation, that's when a probiotic may be helpful because then your neighborhoods may not be great. If your neighborhoods are full of maybe not so good bacteria, that is when things like fermented food and a probiotic could really, really, really be beneficial. But if you're already in fairly good health, dumping a billion of whatever bacteria is probably not gonna do anything because it doesn't have anywhere to go. There's one exception to this. There are a few studies that indicate if mom is GBS positive, which is about 40% of moms right now, um, there have been studies that showed that there are two species, specifically of lactobacillus, that would naturally be in the vagina to fight this, that are sometimes missing and can help to reverse the GBS status of mom, and that is L. rhamnosus and L. ruteri. There's a few kinds of probiotics on the market that have both of those in there. I was GBS positive for my second labor, so I did this, and that can be really helpful. But again, we don't know most of the different, that's that one's mine. 
Uh, we don't know most of the different uh, bacteria species that are in the gut. So, um, you know, a lot of people will say, you know, this species is great for reflux or this species is great for this. There's not a whole lot of research yet. So the best thing that you can do is support your gut by not over cleaning yourself, by eating things that are high in um, gelatin. You want to do things like bone broth and natural gelatin, which is really, um, it reduces the inflammation of the gut. It helps support the gut lining and lots of good real animal fat. And that's not popular with everybody, but you, every single cell in your body is surrounded by a cell membrane. If you remember back to middle school science, you have the phospholipid bilayer, it's fat. It is all fat and you need fat for every cell and you want good fat. And one of the most important areas of fat in your body is the lining of your tummy. If you don't have good you don't have a good phospholipid bilayer, a really good healthy fat that's full of gelatin, you get cracks. You get inflammation and you get cracks. And once you get a crack, when you eat something, a, a little piece of it will break off and will leave through there. That's what they call leaky gut syndrome, if you've ever heard of that. And once you get anything that isn't you, anything that isn't a cell that you have made into the bloodstream, your body is going to attack it. That's when we get things like systemic inflammation. It's when we get things like food allergies. It's one of the reasons that it's extremely important to wait four to six months, really six months is best for a baby to eat any solid food. It's not because baby can't swallow it, it's literally because baby's gut is permeable. We don't want to put any food into a baby's gut when it is permeable because then it will cross into the bloodstream and it can cause inflammation and issues later. I've thrown a lot of science words at you. If you need if you need any of this information, I'm going to give you cards and things, and I can send all of this to anybody who needs it. But does anybody have any questions? Yeah? So, um, I thought it was 